Good morning, friends. I'm glad that you're able to join me this morning as we look together at Psalm 45. Now, Psalm 45 is a psalm that invites us to consider weddings, which isn't actually a happy thing to consider right now, is it? This is going to be one of those years where a lot of weddings are going to be very different, maybe much smaller or maybe even just weddings that are done online. I wonder if that's going to be a thing even, like an online YouTube wedding where family and friends can get together and celebrate through a video with just a videographer and the uh, clergy and the bride and the groom and maybe one or two friends. A smaller wedding is a, it's kind of a sad thing, isn't it? It's a sad thing not because it's less effective than a larger wedding, but at the end of the day, both cup, both parties are the, they're married. That's the good part. But it's sadder because there's fewer people to celebrate the wedding together. And the more people that are there celebrating, there's kind of this joy that builds to be friends of the bride and groom, to celebrate their love and to celebrate their success and um, just to, to be there to encourage them and love them. And this is the neat thing about Psalm 45, is that this is a psalm that's definitely done from the perspective of the friend of the bride and the groom. Now this psalm is said in a kingly wedding. This is a king who is uh, marrying his bride, who is a princess. She's the daughter of another king. So there's the element of what's going on here is there's a... Um, there's all of that glorious royal language, and there's also all of these implications that since Christ is our king and we, the church, are the bride of Christ, this is very much a psalm that has all sorts of messianic, looking forward to Christ, overtones that you're just going to hear, and they are, boy, are they going to stand out as we read this together. But as we begin to look at it now, the first verse is what catches my attention. I've always liked this verse. Since the first time I read my way through the Psalms, this first stung, stood out to me. And I didn't understand it till I was reading it today. And that is, the verse begins, My heart is stirred by a noble theme, as I revite, recite my verses for the king. My tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. So that verse is interesting because that verse is one of the very few times in the Psalms where the psalmist pauses and he tells us that he's writing. He tells us what's going on in his heart as he's writing the psalm, or as he's reciting the psalm. There's this element that he's putting himself into the story of the bride and the groom, and he's speaking to them, as it were, maybe as the best man speaks uh, after the wedding or at the rehearsal dinner before the wedding, blessing both couples and encouraging both parties and encouraging them as they prepare for the wedding. So I hope that you hear that and you enjoy that. And I want you to put yourself in the wedding, not as the onlookers, but in a way, uh, the Bible tells us that we are the bride of Christ. So here in this narrative, God calling you to be his bride, God encouraging you in your united, faithful love of your Savior. There's so much going on there that we can celebrate and think about. So I'm going to invite you to read this psalm with me, and then we'll reflect on it for a minute afterwards. Hold on to your seat. Here we go. Psalm 45, for the director of music, to the tune of lilies, of the sons of Korah, a wedding song. My heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite my verses for the king. My tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. You are the most excellent of men, and your lips have been anointed with grace, since God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword upon your side, O mighty one. Clothe yourself with splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride forth victoriously in behalf of truth, humility, and righteousness. Let your right hand display awesome deeds. Let your sharp arrows pierce the hearts of the king's enemies. Let the nations fall beneath your feet. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. All your robes are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From the palaces adorned with ivory, the music of the strings makes you glad. 
Daughters of kings are among your honored women. At your right hand is the royal bride in the gold of Ophir. Oh, listen, daughter. Consider and give ear. Forget your people in your father's house. The king is enthralled with your beauty. Honor him, for he is your lord. The daughter of Tyre will come with a gift. Men of wealth will seek your favor. All glorious is the princess within her chamber. Her gown is interwoven with gold. In embroidered garments she is led to the king. Her virgin companions follow her. They are brought to you. They are led in with joy and gladness. They enter the palace of the king. Your sons will take the place of your fathers. You will make them princes throughout the land. I will perpetuate your memory through all generations. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever and ever. So what a beautiful psalm this is. Here we have, once again, this very conscious moment where at the very beginning, at the end of the psalm, the writer speaks to the bride and the groom. Now, thinking about this in terms of the messianic nature of the psalm, I kind of feel like in this case, the writer is the Holy Spirit. You could give me your own opinion about that, but I think that fits very well at the beginning. Um, the writer, this is the Holy Spirit speaking through the sons of Corinth. At the very end, it's a promise that the Holy Spirit is speaking to Christ and to the church. I will perpetuate your memory through all generations. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever and ever. And this is Christ, the Holy Spirit's work in the church, right? To, um, to point us to Jesus, to reveal Jesus, and so that we can take our hope and our, be sure in him. So that's that. But then everything else that's going on here is neat. He, first, he had, the, the psalmist addresses the king who's going to the wedding. And he doesn't just address him as the king going to the wedding, but he says, rule righteously. Take a, go into battle and in battle fight for justice, truth, uh, for truth, humility, and righteousness. You be, be fierce and be uh, the Lord God will protect you on your throne. Love righteousness, hate wickedness. So there's this whole sense where the psalmist, as he speaks to the king, says, O king, do what is right, live what is right. And this is the important thing that we need to understand about the kings in the time of Judah and the time of Israel, is God said that the kings very much had to be focused on his law. So much so that they were supposed to take either the whole Torah or just the book of Deuteronomy, and they were supposed to, before they became king, they were supposed to copy it. Take a copy of it out of the temple and copy it for themselves. And then taking that copy, they were supposed to be daily reading that book. That's why it was probably the book of Deuteronomy. But they were supposed to be reading that book daily so that they understood the law of God, so that they could rule righteously, rule as servants of God. Um, now, did the kings do that? We know that they didn't. They failed horribly at that part of it. In fact, it's uh, it, by the time King um, Josiah gets there, the book of Deuteronomy itself has been lost entirely, and they find it in the walls of the temple when they're doing repairs, bring it out, and then Josiah realizes what the impact part of this psalm is. So, we're, yeah, and everybody reads it. The story of Josiah is amazing. Go and read that sometime. So, anyways, you get this focus on encouraging the king to do what is right. Then the psalmist turns and he looks at the princess and he says, You come, you're dressed beautifully, you're surrounded by your bridesmaids. Now forget your father's house. Forget your allegiances to others. Turn your eyes towards the kingdom that you are now marrying into. Serve them. Honor your king and raise your sons in such a way that they are great kings in this land. And then he turns once again to the king and he says, Your sons will take the place of your fathers. You will make them princes throughout the land. And then the words, the last words of blessing at the end. So this is a psalm that has a very real context to it, and a context that we need to think about. It's a context that calls us to understand not only what marriage is between a man and a woman, so if you have friends, relatives who are getting married, read this psalm and think about what your role is as somebody who's been invited to attend their wedding or to celebrate their wedding with them. Is your role um, to encourage them? Absolutely. What do you encourage them to do? You encourage them to live in the righteousness of God, to take these words, especially verses 4 through 7, to heart and just sing that to them so that they are encouraged in their love for God and in their love for each other. 
And then there's just this need that uh, we need to celebrate these things together. So uh, this is kind of a sad psalm for me as I think about it and then think about those that are not going to be married in the same big crowds that they normally would have. Not that I'm a really big crowd wedding sort of guy. I just like a wedding, but where people are happy and people are celebrating something beautiful, like uh, uh, which is what a, every marriage is. It's a celebration of something beautiful. It's a gift from God. So today, as well as you read this psalm, I pray that uh, the Holy Spirit speaks to you and that you are reminded that you are the bride of Christ and that you would set yourself apart and hunger for his righteousness and hunger to see him and be united with him as we will only see happen in that long uh, future day when he is returned to us and we to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and we thank you for your mercy and we thank you that we have a future with you a promised future that will never end. Now we see in part, but then we will see in full. We thank you, Father, for the marriages that we have. For I thank you for my marriage, and I thank you for my parents' marriage, and I thank you for the many marriages that I see in my community and in my church that just give me cause to praise God and say how good is the King that he makes us to work together in this way and to cause each other to grow closer to him. We praise you, Father, for your blessings and for your mercy and for your peace. Help us to, to look to you and to live uh, in the words of the psalmist there, to live um, fighting on behalf of truth, humility, and righteousness for the glory of our King. Amen. Well, friends, I uh, hope that you have a blessed and beautiful day. Bye-bye.